Welcome, I'm Bill Everett, and in this episode, we'll be looking at the string quartets of Beethoven. Ludwig van Beethoven remains one of the most iconic figures of the European cultural heritage, who is being mythologized even while he was still alive. And by 1902, on the 75th anniversary of his death, the images created of him in Vienna were, simply put, remarkable. In a special exhibition housed in the succession building, two stunning depictions were on display. In one, the sculptor Max Klinger depicted Beethoven as an enthroned classical deity, an immortal force of tremendous power. In the other, the painter Gustav Klimt, as part of his stunning Beethoven frieze, portrays Beethoven as a knight in gold armor whose music can save the world from its evils. Beethoven lives on. He is a character in the film Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, and references to him, oral and visual, appear in television series as varied as Doctor Who and Empire. His ode to joy is the anthem of the European Union. But what is it about Beethoven that made him such a cultural icon? 19th century writers such as E.T.A. Hoffman exalted Beethoven. Hoffman, and this is the same E.T.A. Hoffman who created the supernatural story of the Nutcracker on which Tchaikovsky based his famous ballet, wrote that, and I quote, the correct and fitting performance of a work of Beethoven's asks nothing more than that one should understand him, that one should enter deeply into his being, that conscious of one's own consecration. One shall boldly dare to step into the circle of the magical phenomena that his powerful spell has evoked. End quote. Just as transformation and transcendence are at the heart of the fictional tale of the Nutcracker, so do they infuse the music of Beethoven. Beethoven's compositional career is typically divided into three large style periods, early, middle, and late. Alternative names also appear, imitative for the early period, heroic for the middle one, and introspective for the last. Throughout, there is a sense of Beethoven's individuality. The first period lasted until about 1802, and as the descriptive title implies, includes works that largely follow 18th century models, but with some innovative features. Beethoven did not just mimic the music of composers like Haydn and Mozart. The second period is when most of his large-scale heroic works, such as the Fifth Symphony and his only opera, Fidelio, appeared. It lasted until about 1812 when Beethoven's music turns inward and becomes especially immersed in fugal procedures, variation sets, and aspects of vocal genres being transferred to instrumental idioms. I like to think of these periods in terms of energy, remembering way back to high school physical science classes. The early period is potential energy. Something is there waiting to be released. The second is kinetic energy, energy in motion. For the third, I like to think of it as dissipated energy. We know it was there and sense a continued presence, though the dynamic kineticism is not a wholly active force. One could even think of these late works as music about music. In 1801, Beethoven's first set of published string quartets appeared as Opus 18. Opus numbers refer to the order in which works were published. Following tradition in how string quartets would be published in groups in the 1700s, this set includes six quartets. They all exhibit the four-movement plan Beethoven inherited from Haydn and Mozart, though they are far from being mere copies of works from the previous century. A solid first movement with a focus on musical process is followed by a lyrical slow movement, a lively dance movement, and an energetic finale. Beethoven, being Beethoven, doesn't take this plan at face value and begins to imprint his own distinctive mark on the genre. For example, the final movement of the sixth quartet, the last movement of the entire set, 
is titled The Malinconia, Melancholy, and is an emotional and musical tour de force filled with angst-driven intensity, rustic dance-like passages, and dramatic pauses. It is far from a cheery, feel-good finale. Beethoven typically employed what is known as sonata form for his first movements. This is a dramatic structure that was being codified in the late 18th century and became a quintessential foundation for many pieces written in the Germanic tradition throughout the entire 19th century. It is a musical corollary to a very basic type of storytelling. We meet two characters who have some sort of conflict. In musical terms, they are centered on different pitch levels or keys. After we meet the characters, who may or may not have similar personalities, as is evident in their respective musical moods, many times a composer will repeat this meeting, called an exposition, so we get another chance to meet the two characters. Then they begin to work out their conflict in the development section. Their musical ideas are broken down into smaller parts, combined in different ways, and heard individually and together, sometimes elongated, sometimes compressed, and sometimes upside down. The tonal center or that home pitch seems to be shifting almost constantly. We really are getting to what is at the root of their disagreement. Then comes the resolution or the recapitulation. Here, the two themes are presented, this time on the same pitch level, showing that the conflict is resolved. This is the basic plan. Composers may add an introduction that may or may not have much to do with the rest of the movement, and sometimes there's a coda at the end just to solidify the conflict's tonal resolution. Oftentimes, when the development section is especially complex and fraught, as in the case in much of middle period Beethoven, a longer coda provides the security that the conflict indeed is resolved. Many television sitcom episodes are in sonata form. Sometimes something appears before the opening credits that may or may not have anything to do with the plot. That's the introduction. Then we learn of some conflict that exists among the characters, the exposition. A large part of the episode is spent dealing with the conflict, that development, which has resolved the recapitulation. Sometimes a bit more happens after a final commercial break, the coda. To hear how one of these movements works, we'll be watching the first movement of the second quartet in Beethoven's Opus 18. Here, the first theme is highly motivic, that is, it's made up of short musical ideas. The second theme, by contrast, exudes a graceful, stately nature. After being stated in the first violin, it is repeated, now featuring the viola and the cello. After we've met the themes in this exposition, which has its own final material to give a sense of closure, Beethoven repeats it. We then move into the development, where the motives are passed around from instrument to instrument and broken down and reassembled in new ways. Then, the recapitulation occurs with the reappearance of the first theme. The second theme follows in due course, now in the same key as the first theme. We may not be perceiving why the music sounds more settled than it did in the exposition, but it's because we've just heard both themes in the same key. The movement ends with a gentle restatement of the by now familiar opening motive, Beethoven ending the movement very much how he began it. It's not that the motive has been changed, but thanks to Beethoven, our experience of it certainly has. Thank you.
glorious music. Moving to Beethoven's middle period, the set of three quartets, Opus 59, were dedicated to the Russian ambassador in Vienna, Count Andrei Krirovich Razumovsky, one of Beethoven's friends who is also a fine violinist. Beethoven, in these works, is enhancing the seriousness of the string quartet genre by including only three larger and more substantive works in the set, rather than the traditional customary six. This is the last time Beethoven will include more than one string quartet in a single opus or publication. After the appearance of the Razumovsky quartets in 1806, every string quartet by Beethoven will have its own opus number, an overt sign of Beethoven's choice in making each work in the genre something that is worthy to stand on its own rather than be part of a group of pieces. The Razumovsky Quartets, like most of Beethoven's string quartets, received their premieres with the Schupanzik Quartet. Led by the very fine first violinist Ignaz Schupanzik, the quartet and Beethoven enjoyed a symbiotic relationship. The quartet became famous because of its association with Beethoven, and Beethoven's string quartets achieved popularity because of their performance by the Schupanzik Quartet. For the first performances of the Razumovsky Quartets, the second violin part was played by none other than Count Razumovsky himself. These quartets far exceeded what was thought tenable for a string quartet at the time, with the first quartet lasting about 40 minutes, when most string quartets would be about 25 minutes. It was not just their scope, but their musical properties that astounded performers and audiences. It was about this set that Beethoven remarked to a confused violinist trying to make sense out of the parts, these are not for you, but for a later age. We'll spend a bit of time with the opening movement of the second of these three wonderful quartets. From the very first sounds, we know this will be a different sound world. The dramatic chords give way to music that seems to be starting and stopping with emphatic shifts in volume before the music seems to settle for a moment, only to venture into new regions filled with startling new sounds and metric ambiguity. That is, shifting between beats that are emphasized either every two pulses or every three pulses. This is middle period, kinetic Beethoven, overflowing with energy. In watching this performance by the Shanghai String Quartet, pay special attention to the second violinist. Realize that it was a political ambassador, a career diplomat, one who loved and supported the arts, to be sure, who played this part in the work's first performance. It is a testament to Razumovsky's highly accomplished musical abilities. <laughs> Thank you. 
when we get to late Beethoven, the world changes. The music takes on a sense of tremendous interiority and introspection. The driving energy of the middle period works have given way to something more enduring, more eternal, more ethereal. Furthermore, no longer do string quartets have to include four movements. Among the six so-called late quartets, one of them has six movements, another seven, and still another five. This is music of transcendence, the type of work that caused writers about music, such as E.T. Hoffman, to look to instrumental music as a sort of secular religion, where deep truths could be communicated that touched the very core of humanity, and which were so essentially human that their ideas could not be expressed in mere words. As an example of late Beethoven, we'll listen to the slow movement of his final string quartet, Opus 135, written in 1826. The Schipanza Quartet gave its first performance in 1828, the year after Beethoven's death. Hence, no performance of this work took place during Beethoven's lifetime. Here, time seems to stand still, and the power of stasis represents the overt energy we heard in the early and middle period works. This movement is actually a set of variations in which, like in the development sections of his Sonata Four movements, Beethoven just doesn't elaborate on a theme as was typical for a variation set or add filigree to it or change it in overt ways, but rather digs into what lies beneath. And he allows us to witness those unseen or unheard elements that dwell below the surface. Thank you for joining us for this episode, The String Quartets of Beethoven. To conclude, here's the Dover Quartet to perform the sublime slow movement, the third movement of Beethoven's final string quartet. <laughs> 